So thank you. I'm going to call the Finance Committee meeting um, to order at, um, this is 2 o'clock. Yeah. And uh, appreciate your being here. And uh, we're here um, is our continued budget review to um, hear presentations on two sections of the budget that are um, not part of the uh, town specific functional areas, the libraries and the elementary schools. And uh, so the library director is here too. I think that the one thing that I would hope that you will be able to cover in the presentation without my having to ask the question later, but I can ask the question later, is uh, touch on um, changes from the current year and what you perceive to be the hardest decisions that um, had to be confronted in um, developing the budget, because I think that's the kind of insight that would be helpful. So, Dick Morris, thank you. Thanks for the uh, preview, because uh, I think we can adjust. It. It's similar to what we were thinking of presenting. We're also conscious of time, and that we have someone behind us who also wants to uh, share with you her budget. Um, but we, we thank you for having us. We thank you for um, talking through the Amherst Elementary School budget. And I can, my quick overview uh, will be just two quick statements, and, and then I'll pass it to Mr. Mangano, the first of which is that this is an unusually positive budget a year for the Amherst public schools. We are not in a place where we are having to reduce, which is a novel thing for us, a very pleasantly novel thing for us. Some of this we knew potentially was coming with enrollment um, shifts in terms of sixth grade students moving to seventh grade and some of the needs that would then travel to the region and some are due to health insurance savings and, and other efficiencies that we've tried to realize. We also don't want to get used to it because we know it won't happen again in the past in the future, excuse me, uh, in the same way it is now. And the second is we've taken the opportunity this year to think about both sustainability, but also to make sure our budget reflects our values. And so when I talk about budget adds, cuts, and uh, adjustments, uh, I'll be able to speak to what I mean when I say that trying to make sure the budget reflects our values. With that, I'll turn to Mr. Mangano, who can go over more of the detailed financials. Hello, everyone. So the, you have a packet in front of you. I'm going to go through that packet and touch on um, the key points. Um, I apologize, the cover page says presented to town council. I should say finance committee, but you're all counselors, so it's not completely inaccurate. Um, but I'll start going through that. So th this packet are just um, selected pages from the full budget document. So everything that's in front of you are just, again, specific cutouts from the full budget document. So I'm going to go to page five in your packet. So the budget that was approved by the school committee that's in front of you is for $23,838,854, which meets the guidance we received from the finance committee, or it was like a dollar off, dollar under. I think we came in slightly under, actually. <laughs> Sonia was very upset with me about that. <laughs> um, there is a pie, and this is a, sorry, 2.6% increase over the FY. 19 budget. Um, if you remember, the, the guidance for all the departments was a 2.5% increase, um, but because of the way the charter tuition works between the school budget and the town budget, we actually came in a little bit above the 2.5. Um, the pie chart below is hard to see on the screen, but this is a breakdown of our budget into different functional areas. Um, the large blue, which is the largest section, is uh, regular instruction, and then we have special education instruction in red, which is the second largest. Um, noteworthy is that the green section and the purple section are um, retiree health insurance and active employee health insurance. So those two percentages combined are about 18 percent of the total budget, just so you have a sense of what that uh, comprises. Um, and also worth noting, um, pension costs are not part of the school budget directly. So all the pension costs get paid out of that general pot of money that the town takes off the top before they issue guidance to the town or the departments. Um, so pension costs are not held here, um, unlike the region where they are held in the budget. Uh, I'm going to move forward to page six. So on page six, it's just a little sort of informational chart um, for you all to look at that shows some of our non-Chapter 70 state aid reimbursements um, for the elementary school, really the two of the bigger ones. Um, our charter tuition and homeless student transportation. 
and neither one of these are fully funded. Both of them get, um, or again, only partially funded. And so you can see there's different fiscal years there, um, what the, the funding would be sort of under the law if it was fully funded, and then what we've actually received, um, and then sort of some of the difference. So the biggest one is obviously charter tuition. Um, we're about a million dollars under over the last six years uh, what we should have received if that was fully funded. Um, and homeless transportation is one that's sort of growing um, as a cost for us. Um, and it's very volatile from year to year. We don't know what our costs are going to be, but they're, they're not fully funding that. It's about, I think they're at like 30% to 40% reimbursement for those costs. So I think it's also worth noting that, um, as you know, we build our budgets before the state solves their budget um, uh, discussions or resolves their budget discussions. And there's certain, certainly indications that in the current budget that's being debated between the House, the Senate, and the governor, there actually is neutral to negative impact. Uh, possible in the elementary school budget, particularly as it relates to charter tuition with a proposed change that the governor made that was supported in the House and not quite in the Senate that would uh, potentially have a, a negative financial impact on our budget uh, for next year and then moving forward. So that's not resolved. We try to take a conservative approach when we're budgeting, but I, uh, I don't want to go serious too off course, but I think, you know, budgeting is an estimate and, you know, we're estimating our own costs. We're also estimating the revenues that we've come in from the state. And we have no indication that any of the bills being uh, actively considered by the House and the Senate or the governor right now will, will do much in the way of positive um, fluctuation from what we're estimating and potentially could go the other direction. Yeah, and the school committee is actively working with the local legislators to do the best they can to sort of make that heard. Um, but it's a, it's a tough one. Do you want to pause for a second on the subject and see if the, everybody's understand where we're at? We're in the very strange thing where the legislature passes a law saying that it is our, our intent to fund something and then the same legislature comes in and doesn't appropriate the money to say what they intended to do. And that's where those gaps occur. Um, Sonia, you may be the one to help us with this too, is when, uh, if these changes happen, they're actually um, money we don't receive because of the cherry sheet. And so we have to figure out how we're adjusting for that but where, and where that falls. And that's a discussion that um, we need to have as a committee at some point to understand how that works. Um, I don't think necessarily now, but I just wanted to bring it up. Um, is there any questions on this, or shall we go forward? Um, I, I have a question if it goes in a positive direction. So there is some, whether it's the charter or transportation, there's some discussion of the foundation budget be, being enhanced. If it goes better, um, that money means more state money than what happens locally you know, to the school budget. Do you run a surplus? What, what happens? So that money doesn't go directly to the schools. It goes to the town. Um, and I won't speak for Sonia, but I'll just say what I think happens, and then she can tell me if I'm wrong. Um, there's going to be some accounts that come in over, some accounts that come in under. Um, whatever that difference ultimately will probably um, go into free cash at the end of the year. It doesn't affect the current year's budget. OK, so I'll, I'll spread it to what does the town do if we get more than we thought? Okay, um, the expense side, once you vote the appropriations, that's, that's um, cemented in what, it, with your votes. But the revenue side is not complete or balanced until we set the tax rate. So if more money comes in from state aid, we would probably reduce our local receipts estimates to balance that out because we have to have a balanced budget, zero expenses and revenues. And if more money comes in, if our uh, local receipts do better. That just comes in as excess and closes out to free cash or reserve, or and then we put it into stabilization. Yeah. So, is my last comment because we could spend, we could shift and spend a lot of time on this, but um, in terms of what's being proposed now, and I'm not here to critique any legislate the legislature, um, there's been a lot of um, articles about what's been proposed the last few weeks, and, and none of that would have a positive impact on the Amherst Public Schools in terms of what's being proposed right now. Um, so I, I just want to, I think, you know, you could see a headline, and then if you drill down into specific like cherry sheets and, and the impact on us, um, 
there really isn't any. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Dorothy. Um, I guess I'm very surprised to hear that because I thought that there was common through the towns that the formula was very bad and discriminated against the um, major public schools. What is the reasoning for this new possible worse formula? So that would probably take us down. Uh, I mean, I think we could have that conversation. Um, I, 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 get a, I guess my reservation is that um, things aren't settled yet. They're still being discussed. Um, but what the intent has been, the stated intent has been, is to support and increase the funds for low-income communities, of which, while we do have a significant low-income population, we certainly don't fit um, the gateway city kind of piece. Uh, I think as I look at the data as it's come in, and I have shared this with the town manager, um, I see trends that way. I honestly have some concerns about districts getting above um, the $30 per pupil where our district is, um, and some of them significantly more wealthy than this town. Mm -hmm. um, so we could, um, you know, whether Mr. Mangano, myself, or town manager, we could certainly follow up offline, and I'm happy to share with you what's been proposed and the impact on all the communities in the Commonwealth. Thank you. Keep going? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, our special education um, budget seems quite high. Is that normal relative to other neighboring towns or? Um, it's hard to say. We have a higher percentage of special education students than most of our neighboring towns. Um, and we try to keep uh, special education students in-house. So, so just general observation, what I've noticed is our in-district special education spending is higher than average for our neighbors, but our out-of-district spending is lower because we keep more kids in district. So it's always one of the challenges we have is trying to find a very comparable district, but I'm sure a lot of people say this, but it's very hard to find a comparable district to ours because we have a, a large percentage of special education students, we have a large percentage of low-income students, and we have a large percentage of ELL students. Um, I think Dr. Morris has said this, is we're very close to the state average in all those, but no individual community is very similar to us, at least out this way, um, in this side of the state. But I would say it's, it's, it's similar to what it's been, and it's, um, it's reflective of the number of special education students we have in the district. It, it, is it also driven, do we have differentially or notably lower class sizes than um, some of the other districts? I don't know which, which ones you would be, sure. comp but I'm thinking the two things, it's the mix of students and uh, student ratio, which could be also because you've got special needs kids or, that are in smaller class sizes. So, uh, yeah, I can speak to it. So last year I did an analysis and we had the lowest class size of districts in Western Massachusetts. Uh, we didn't, I didn't do a full a full comparison to all districts, but our class size was lower um, than our neighboring districts in um, Hamden. I look particularly at Hampshire and, and Hamden County, Franklin County, because there's so many tiny schools. Like, it, class size means something different when you've got 120 kids and trying to figure out which school. You know, it, it really it's so variable. But for districts our size, uh, a little smaller, a little larger in, in the two counties uh, that I mentioned, we had the lowest class size, and that does influence, you know, the per pupil spending significantly. Um, on the next page, uh, page seven, I'll just quickly highlight some of the things we've been doing to try to control costs. Um, many of these are um, in conjunction with the town or the town is led on a lot of these. Um, the first one is joining the Maya Health um, Trust Group. Um, so we'll talk about this in a little bit, but our insurance rate for next year is going up less than a percent. Um, and that's one of the major factors why the, the budget next year is in good shape. Um, the next one is we did a competitive procurement, um, thanks to our procurement officer and the town hall staff, um, competitive procurement of our liability insurance. And so there was a pretty large reduction in our liability insurance costs. Um, we ended up switching carriers. Um, and that's reflected in this budget as well, that that, that cost has dropped. Um, we brought our food service program back in-house, and I'll point that out later, that our, our food service program is performing uh, at a really high level right now, in particular financially. Um, and so that's, at least at this point, looks like a good decision. Um, and some other things over the past, you know, 10 years that we've done just to reduce costs. Yeah. Sorry. I just wanted to go back to the special ed question for a second. Just uh, the one thing I think worth noting is in 2013, we had a, what was then called a coordinated program review of our special education services. 
and they had a, a four findings that we needed to actually create a correct, corrective, corrective action plan for. Um, and so our spending did go up after we received that state review. We recently, it happens on six year cycles. So we just recently had our state review and, and we're very proud that we had no findings, which means that everything was, was met, not just from a compliance perspective, but from a programmatic perspective to be what DESE would want. Uh, mm -hmm. We heard anecdotally very strong feedback, although the report just had to check boxes in the right place, mm -hmm. right? Because that's the way they, they do it. So we did have an increase in spending to address the needs in, from 2013, and then there was a, a midway report in 2016. Uh, but some of these were um, the state identifying areas in significant need uh, for remediation, and we've done that, but that has in, did increase costs over, those, over that time. Sorry, Mr. Marcano. Um, so the last thing I'll say on this page is, so there is a net addition proposed to this budget of, which again is unusual, um, but of $261,576. Um, in a few pages, we'll get to the breakdown of what goes into that number. So next page is page eight. This is a breakdown of our, um, a summary of our full budget, operating budget. And I'll just highlight some of the key areas that are changing. So. Total salaries are going up $675,888. It's in the light gray column um, under the line where the total is. Uh, that's a really a combination of two things. It's steps and colas uh, for all of our staff. Um, the cost of living adjustment for most of our collective bargaining agreements next year is 1.5%. And in addition, I'll, I'll point this out on the grants page, we're also shifting, there's a, a shift of our, one of our special education grants from the elementary level to the secondary level, and I'll point that out as well. Um, substitute costs are going up as well, $29,630. Um, some of our substitute rates were right at minimum wage, um, and so we're, we have a plan to increase those incrementally each year for the next few years to make sure we, at a minimum, keep pace with minimum wage, um, but try to get a little bit above that to attract staff. Um, the next one, if you go down to special education, which is in the expense accounts, um, where it's a $71,000, $71,955 increase, um, so that's sort of the largest increase in our budget outside of payroll, and that's because we went from expecting zero placements um, in FY19. We had two. We ended up having two out of district placements, and so those two placements have been budgeted for next year. And so that's why you see that significant increase in cost. Down below in the health insurance sections, you'll see those again. This is really the impetus for why we have a good budget year. Um, a pretty two pretty large drops in health insurance rates. Um, it's a combination of two factors. One, our, the health insurance surcharge went away completely. Um, I, is it still frozen or is it gone? It's gone. Um, not coming back. So, so that surcharge going away dropped our rates from what they were budgeted for in FY19. Um, the rate increase was less than a percent, so the surcharge going away more than offset that. And in addition, we saw some drop in enrollment um, when we changed health insurance um, went from self-insured to the trust fund, we saw a drop in the number of people enrolled in our health insurance as well. Um, so the combination of those three factors really um, dropped our health insurance costs significantly, um, which is good because if you remember the year before, it was a really large increase. So I sort of just got it back into line with where we were. Um, and I think the last thing I'll just point out is um, to Mr. Steinberg's point in the beginning, what, is, um, what are the changes in next year's budget? Um, so the way we do our budgets is Everything that's in the expense accounts and the payroll accounts in these top two sections of this table, that's what we call level services. So we basically take this year's level of services, we project that forward one year and show you what it would cost. So when we're able, we include um, contractual cost increases, you know, changes in usage, data, things like that. All that's reflected up above. Any proposed reductions, additions, or other types of adjustments to that level services budget are captured in that one line where it says additions and reductions, and you'll see it says 261,576 there. So that number, and we'll talk about that more in a second, is really what captures the changes from this year's programming to what we're expecting for next year's programming. Any questions on the, this yeah, table? Dorothy, uh, yeah. um, I, I had a question about the substitute salary. Sure. I, I guess part of me is very shocked at the thought that it's at near minimum wage. Right. Um, what, what is it per day? Um, I'll have to get back to you. So it's not all the substitute rates. The teacher rates are different. Um, but our lowest rate, which I think was for a para substitute, was around $11 an hour. So that's why we're increasing the lower rates. But when we increase the lower rates, we're trying to increase the whole scale sort of proportionally. 
Um, but I can send that information to the, to the council. What about somebody who's a licensed teacher, who's a sub? There's, so again, I don't have the exact amounts, but there's um, different rates, whether you're a licensed teacher, whether you're a retired teacher from the district, um, whether it's a short-term sub versus a long-term sub, there's different rates at each of those levels. Um, and the rates are not as high as we would like them to be, um, as any of us would probably like them to be, but I'll, I can send those different rates to you all. Lynn? So, I, I look at this year's budget, and then I look at the projections out, and it makes, it concerns me um, that we'll start, for instance, some new programs, and then not be able to support them, and that raises the question for me, as you look the years out, um, are there things that we should be more cautious about in this year? I'll start. Sure. Um, so one of the things that will really impact our ability to fund the out years is the charter and choice tuition. Um, again, this year is in really good shape because we, the school's got the full 2.5% increase um, that we could apply to our, the schools in Amherst. Um, in prior years, that hasn't been the case. When the charter tuition was rising significantly, that gets taken off the top of what the schools here get to, to use for the budgets. So this year, that's another reason why that was such a good year. Um, so if we can keep that flat and we can continue to get the full increases that are given out to the departments, that'll help us in the future. Um, some of the additions and reductions we can point out on, um, in a couple pages or maybe on the next page are short-term things or one-time things. Keep in mind that, again, this is a really good year, so we didn't want to invest everything in sort of permanent um, fixed types of things. Um, so we'll point those out as well, some of the things that are just one-time investments that we think will go away, which will help offset some of the costs increases in the future. This really follows up on the special uh, observation, yeah. and um, maybe I'm jumping ahead by looking at the translation of uh, this into the chart where you compare FY. 20 to F10, FY10, mm -hmm. and you see basically that we've um, increased special ed almost as much as we've had to decrease regular right. instruction. Right. Yeah, the, the regular instruction, I did want to note this one thing. The regular instruction, the decrease is a little misleading. There, I believe there still would be some decrease, but overall it's a little misleading because in FY10 we didn't... Um, we weren't a participant in the school choice program. We now are a participant in the school choice program. And so I'll point this out on the revolving fund page, but $500,000 of um, really classroom teacher salaries, which fall under the regular ed section, are not in this proposed general fund budget because they're in the school choice revolving fund budget. So if you, it's always hard because it's different program, or it's a program that we decided to participate in. But really, if you wanted to compare apples to apples, um, you would have to add that $500,000 that we're currently removing. Um, you'd have to add that back in. Um, the other thing I'll say is the, I think some of the regular instruction drop is because our enrollment has continued to drop over the years. And where we see that mostly is in the classroom, number of classroom teachers we have, which again are in the regular instruction area. Um, I'll let Dr. Morris probably has a better hand on this, whether the number of special education students we've had have dropped as significantly as our overall enrollment over the years. Yeah, so, so the quick answer to that is no. So there are, our special education percentage, if you look at the percentage of special education students, I'm gonna change the, the language I'm using. If you look at the raw number of special education students from now until 10 years ago, there's not nearly the same drop as there is of students on the whole. So that also is reflected in the budget. I think Mr. Mangano's point is, is worthwhile because the school choice piece, we use that to fund the regular education, to fund you know, generally classroom teacher salaries. So if you added that to the line for regular instruction, you'd see it's almost the same. I mean, it would, it would increase at about 2%. So where you see it at about 29%, it would, it would essentially be at about 31%. So it would not be as significant a shift because of how we fund our regular education student uh, staffing uh, really comes from the school choice program that didn't exist for the district in 2010. Yeah, and I'll just add to that, where we apply those school choice funds is always a, is always a point of contention for some people. Um, because in the school choice funds we um, receive, 
some of that is for special education students. Um, the practice that has existed in the district is we try to apply it to as few aligns as possible so that we're not like breaking it up into a thousand different accounts. Um, and so we've picked classroom teachers with the thought that all right, classroom teachers sort of handle the most number of students, so let's focus it there. Um, some districts do it differently, and, and we may review in the future too if we want to do it differently in terms of where we apply those school choice funds so that, that it doesn't create that weird, um, just makes it so the comparison isn't as good as you'd want it to be. Um, and the chair can just say to me, this is really not a finance question. It's more of an educational um, leadership question, decision-making question. So as we moved into school choice, would you observe that some people choose our programs to choice, to option choice in, if you will, because we do offer better special ed programs? So I think, uh, here's the way to answer it. I, I, I think we have a positive reputation in the area and beyond for doing right by kids. Because I, I don't think about it, the programs, I think about what a kid's need and what's the district's ability to respond to them. So our special ed director, I know I'm on camera now, but my special ed director <laughs> always says that, you know, it'd be great if special ed was the best kept secret in the district, right? But that's not how things work in the real world. Uh, and she knows that. It, it, it's, it's kind of a, a throwaway line. So from a choice perspective, I don't think it's the case that we get our highest need students because um, we do have the ability, if it's going to go into a specialized program, to not take choice students based on space. And we have space has been a consideration. Um, there's also, as recently as last Friday, we got a memo which actually has pretty significant impact on choice program, not so much at the current time, but over time it will, that they are um, Amherst Elementary School students who enter as choice students starting next year. So everyone who's a choice student now is grandfathered in but uh, we'll no longer have access to the regional schools without entering another choice lottery. So there's a, there's a legal advisory that Desi gave. It's gonna be interesting how that affects families' choices about whether to choice into the district or not in the future. We won't know till we get there, but um, I think as it relates to choice, we don't see um, necessarily the most um, challenging students necessarily in terms of needs, meeting their needs coming from choice, but. I think it is, there's definitely families who say, you know, we understand that you take care of children and we think that our child would be best served in this district. So follow up, is it also possible that by doing that, we actually, by having more students and therefore more fat, more staff, right. we can offer better services to our own kids? Absolutely, so I mean, I would, I would say, that I said this at the school committee, that uh, we have a, pol a policy, it's not a policy, school committee policy, but we have a practice in the district of never accepting choice students that require the addition of another teacher. So in other words, we're never in the place where we say, oh, we, we take six more kids, we can add another classroom and lower class size. We, we just expressly do not do that. So it's the case that if we have, let's say, 14 students enrolled for a kindergarten class, making this hypothetical up, we may say, well, 14 students is lovely, financially that's gonna be hard to maintain. If we take three or four students and we get that size to be upper teens, uh, up to 20, financially that's a benefit, it pays for part of the teacher who will be teaching them, but that teacher was gonna be there already. So absolutely I feel like it's a net financial benefit and, net, and thus a net educational benefit. Um, you know, we have full-time specialists for relatively moderate sized elementary schools, which is a huge benefit to our students. If you look across at other similar sized elementary schools, there are things that they just do not fund. My belief is we would not be able to fund those, and not because we would want to, but financially, if we didn't have choice funds coming in to support them. Thank you. The district. Thank you. Just uh, to give us a context, how many choice in students, roughly, do we have in, the ele in our elementary schools? I would ballpark around 90 this year, um, K-12, K through six. And does the scale issue you just talked about on being supportive if we go from the current three schools down to two, does that change some of the way you look at, potentially change the way you look at scale? You know, some of it, if we're splitting among three schools versus we're splitting among two schools? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's a good five-year problem to have, uh, five years ago, uh, five years from now. Um, but absolutely, we've had some internal conversations about that. I think the same uh, thought process would go, the same practices of not adding not adding students in a way that we have to add a teacher. 
uh, via the choice process would still hold. Um, exactly what that looks like in a different configuration, I think remains to be seen. We do have some schools that accept a lot more choice than others, just frankly, because that's how their enrollment patterns work. For instance, Fort River, when we started the choice program, had a lot of choice students. They have now gotten to the pattern, just based on the enrollment trends that we have, of having two classes per grade level without much room for choice. So we've seen a decrease there where some of the other schools, uh, Crocker Farm, for instance, between two and three classes, invariably we have to make a call, and once you make that call, it influences how many choice students you take. So I think the same, same type of attention would need to be placed on a two-school model to see how does that change the trends and how do those trends play out over time. Yeah, interesting. Um, can you, uh, in terms of costs and expenses, it's not quite clear to me yet. Um, so if you have a special ed choice and a non-special ed choice, what money do they bring in versus how much they cost, as so, you figured out? So um, a non-special education choice student brings in $5,000 per student, and that's been the same rate forever. Um, and a special education um, school choice student, if they have additional costs associated with their IEP, I believe, um, there's a, a, a workbook basically that our special education department completes each year called the school choice claims form. And so all the special education students who are school choice, they, they basically plug in the additional costs um, of them attending and that calculates an additional increment beyond the 5,000. So when we get our revenue every year from school choice, there's sort of the base tuition and then there's the additional increment that we get for special education students. And that can vary based on the level of need that that special education student has. But it, it, it's not, not always clear to me how this can add, re result in a positive budget impact. Um, so, so for example, on the, the non-special education student side, um, if we're gonna have two classrooms and there's 15 students in each classroom, we're gonna pay for those two teachers anyway. If we accept two school choice students each for those classrooms, we can bring in an extra $20,000 um, we're still just paying for those two teachers. Um, there are some, again, very marginal cost increases of supplies, things like of that nature, um, but there's not, a, there's not a, a, the same proportion cost increase of accepting those students. Yeah, I mean, just to put a finer point on the materials, so um, our textbooks are there. So it's not like we have to buy additional textbooks. So there are some workbooks, but we're talking about per student in the two-digit variety of costs. We're not talking about mm -hmm. something that has a major impact on the budget. Okay. And, I, and I think I mentioned this in the past, there are studies that, and we will do these periodically, where we have somebody look at our choice program in more detail just to get some outside advice. Um, we did that at the secondary level, and they affirmed that our program was uh, really well run at that time, and um, we'll probably do that again in the future. So the next page are the proposed additions and reductions, and Dr. Morris is going to go through some of the highlights. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll, I'll try to... I think because of time, I'm not going to go through each line in particular, but certainly there's questions, I'll answer them. But I want to go back to the statement I made at the beginning, which we use this opportunity to make sure our values are reflected in our budget. And so um, I want to speak to two or three values in particular. So one is that, sorry, I marked it up thinking of one-time costs because of Ms. Griezmann's question before. So I'm going to shift. I've two documents, and I'll try to go back and forth with them. The same document, different markups, I should say. So one was about um, the facilities needs. You've certainly heard a lot about facilities needs, um, and some of that's a JCPC and a capital budget issue, and some of that, frankly, was uh, a staffing issue, that um, we wouldn't need to add staff um, if our things didn't go wrong as much as they do, but our facilities needs are such where it's very difficult for us to be proactive. So you'll see two positions that were suggested that are uh, assistant facility director. I think what's worth noting is that typically our central office positions are shared between at least two, if not three districts. This is solely for the elementary schools to take care of the needs of the building. Uh, and the other is a school van driver, which also provides some HVAC support um, because we have a lot of problems with our heating and cooling systems. So that's a major theme. So I know you've heard a lot about that because of a statement of interest process, those of you on JCPC and the capital discussion, but there has to be um, humans who are doing all the work that need to get done, and that's part of it. Oh, yeah, Mr. Mungo. Just the, the assistant facility director. Sorry, this uh, The assistant facility director position, again, that may be a temporary position um, until we get our buildings at a place where we feel good about them. Um, that we have a lot of projects coming up that are going to need sort of project management oversight um, on the ground. And so once we feel the buildings are in good shape, 
hopefully in the next four to five years, um, that is a position that could potentially be shifted out. Thank you. So the second thing, second bucket of um, items that I want to highlight are bilingual psychologist, bilingual special education teacher, and Spanish courses. Now, ironically, my third bucket is going to be dual language. This is not actually related to the dual language program. This is reflecting the needs of our students. So the number of students who come in who are English language learners, particularly with Spanish as their first language, has grown. It's actually the demographic that's growing more significantly than any other demographic that you could cut, not just actually raise ethnicity in our district. Uh, we're up to, at the elementary level, 25% of our students coming from um, are identifying as Latino, Latino heritage. Uh, not all of them are Spanish speakers, for sure, but, but a significant number are. And one of the ongoing challenges as it relates to special education that we've been doing a lot of ongoing professional development on has been how do we distinguish when an English language learner may also have a special need? And it's, it's a puzzle many districts work on. We've had outside PD, we have internal PD, and we've come to the place where we need to add staff who can help us work through that, um, who can assess students bilingually to understand, not through a translator, but literally bilingually to understand students' strengths, challenges uh, across two languages. So that's really reflective of our demographic. Uh, it is the case that as other staff members retire, we will be able to replace them with people who are in these roles. Um, so over time, we feel like it's going to be financially sustainable to do that. Uh, but we do have some really um, significant needs that need to be uh, addressed, and, and that's what those two positions are connected to. Finally, you'll see a pretty modest uh, dual language materials line of $12,500. And part of that is that we don't need to add staffing uh, for the dual language program. We do need to add materials. We were very fortunate to receive, uh, we applied along with the Holyoke Public Schools and received a $300,000 grant for dual language uh, implementation this spring. So uh, we feel like we're in very good shape where actually those funds will be able to look to future years of the implementation. Uh, we're ahead of that. We don't need to use that fun those funds uh, perhaps even for the next year, but we want to always be ahead of it so that when we do have those difficult fiscal years, uh, we're ahead of uh, purchasing the curriculum that we will go along with the program, which is starting next year. Um, certainly, I can answer any questions on any of the other topics, but I just wanted to highlight those particular buckets of, um, of work and, and budget additions in ne for next year's budget. Thank you. Um, maybe actually, before I, since there aren't hands flying up, um, just to, to respond to Ms. Griezmer's point. So if you notice, uh, one of the things we're suggesting is a contribution to the Special Education Stabilization Fund, for those of you who aren't familiar with that, and Mr. Morgano can go into more detail, is uh, if we do have unanticipated special education needs, uh, we are allowed with the Modernization Act, I think from two years ago, to build in, in some ways a reserve that would actually come back to this group as well as the school yeah. committee. So because we are having this positive fiscal, fiscal year, putting that money in and we'll have a healthy balance. So that can be an easy reduction from next year. Okay. Um, I think some other things is we have some math, social studies, and health curriculum we need to purchase. Those are also one year, you know, if you look up, it's the probably fifth or sixth line under budget additions, $30,000. Um, those are some, that's, those are one-time costs um, that we need to address. We need to make some purchases. We need to update our curriculum. We wouldn't Im imagine needing to continue that line moving forward. Um, and I think the only other one I was going to mention, math. yeah, thank you, the math professional development. So we are um, shifting our uh, math curriculum at grades 6 through 12, so in our situation, 6 through 12 is typically what's thought of middle school and high school. Like if you look at publishers, they produce curriculums that are grades 6 through 8, 9 through 12, but don't produce K to 6 curriculums anymore. So our sixth grade for, since I've been in the district 18 years, has been using a different curriculum than the K to 5 population. And so as we're making that shift, well, you'll see that reflected more. You did saw that more reflected at the secondary level, that's a one-time cost looking at sixth grade uh, for new materials and some professional development that we wouldn't anticipate needing in future years' budget. So we are highly conscious that this positive variance won't continue forever, and we try to build the budget in a way that would be sustainable knowing that fact. Yeah, and I'll just point out a couple at the top as well under budget adjustments. So the way this is configured is um, budget adjustments are things that are not really programmatic changes. They're just maybe enrollment shifts or other types of efficiencies that we found. Um, then there's programmatic additions and, and budget reductions. Um, again, you'll see the classroom teacher reduction that's driven uh, by enrollment and the paraeducator um, reduction as well is driven by enrollment. And that's actually, if you remember back to when we came and presented the um, 
regional budget, there was an add of roughly the same number of paraeducators, and it's because they're going from sixth grade to seventh grade. Um, and this is why when I talk about like if we had one budget, like this wouldn't show up on either, it'd just be a natural shift, but because we have that line between sixth grade and seventh grade, it's a reduction here and an add there. Yes, Small amount, but um, I'm just very interested in the planning and exploration to expand preschool. Yeah, hoping that Mr. Bachman would be able to stay for that point. Um, I know he's sitting with the press box, but um, we'll make yeah, so this is actually a joint effort, and, and he knows I'm going to say this. It, it's in the town budget as well um, for a small amount. Uh, one of the frustrations we've had uh, in my time in the district, frankly, has been the inability to meet the demand for um, high quality and low to no cost uh, preschool seats. We know the research is very clear on students who enter kindergarten. We, we have data locally. We know that there's national and, and evidence-based data on the impact. And we've tried multiple times within the Amherst Public School to do that and, and not been successful. So uh, I had multiple meetings with the Community Action. So Community Action is the local Head Start organization. And where we came to is this would be a big endeavor to take on. You know, how could the community, not just the schools, but the community be engaged in this ongoing need and what would it look like for Community Action, which I think is a fabulous program. I've visited there multiple times. Uh, increase the number of seats because they already have full day programs. They already provide transportation. They already work very heavily with communities that may not um, have access to fee-based preschool programs. So uh, we wrote up a proposal for a study. Um, so this will be funded some by the school district and actually some by the town, um, that the town manager felt strongly that this was worth exploring. Um, so it's almost like a planning grant for all three organizations to partner to with. Um, Julie Fetterman will be the contact from the town and we're trying to set up a meeting, um, obviously contingent on budget approval for later this month to be able to sit down and plan what that uh, would look like. I know the community action folks have, they're aware of consultants who do, who, who work with Head Start programs and towns and school districts to see what partnerships would look like. But I think it's the most promising approach. If we're really gonna take this on, it's the most promising approach to work with an already successful preschool program that has the same mission that we're all talking about in mind uh, that happens to be located in town with two sites. So that's what that amount is. Thank you for pointing that out. I, I, I well, and, and nationally, um, in many states, you see combined Head Start and Early Childhood programs, preschool programs, you know, where some kids are, quote, labeled and funded by Head Start and others are not. So I'm glad to see this. Absolutely. They've been wonderful partners today. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. Okay, we're almost done. I'm just going to point out a couple more things. So I, um, I gave you the summary of our, our major grants and revolving funds as well. Um, so the one thing I'll point out on the, well, two things I'll point out on the grant side. Um, the, our inclusive preschool grant, so in line with preschool we were just talking about, um, you'll see our inclusive preschool grant has been significantly reduced over the next few years. I believe it's being phased out for next year, but I can't remember if there was a change to that, but um, that may be the last year that we actually get the inclusive preschool grant. That's right. And then the, uh, earlier I spoke about the increase in payroll and part of that being related to a grant shift. Um, and that grant shift you can see is in the special education IDEA, um, the amount of funds we had available for FY19 versus what we have available for FY20. Um, and it's not a grant reduction, it's just a realignment of how much is being used to support the secondary schools and how much is being used to support the elementary schools and trying to get that more in alignment with the, the students that attend those schools. And then on the, the next... So just on that, so you'd yeah. see that, say, you'd see a plus... Yeah, on the regional, on the region, the, school, the same table literally uh, for the region, okay. yeah. And it actually supports Pelham as well, so there's a, a little piece that goes to Pelham. And then on the revolving funds... Um, Summary, so you can see some of our major programs. Circuit Breaker is the reimbursement for special education. Uh, we have a before school program. The school choice program is listed here, so you can see um, it's, it's broken into expenses on the top and then revenues on the bottom. You can see the expenses are basically how much of the budget, general fund budget we're saying we're gonna support from the school choice monies. Um, and then the revenues is how much we actually brought in that year, and so we try to we're building up a little bit of a reserve in the school choice fund because it's a relatively new program. I think now we're in our fifth or sixth year, but we were building up a balance. Um, but usually those are pretty close, what we're bringing in versus what we use. And then we have a preschool revolving fund, which um, takes in the uh, tuition fees for our preschool program. And then the one thing I did want to point out was our food service program. From FY, 
17, if you look at the revenues, and you look at FY17 revenues versus FY18 revenues, one of the things we're proud of, again, is bringing that program back in-house and seeing it do very well financially. Um, and you can see that in the revenue numbers. Our enrollment did not increase between FY17 and FY18, but our, our revenues went up about $40,000 um, from really the prior two years. So again, so far, that's programs going well. Um, and we have a great f new food service director who's uh, going to keep it going. Any questions on anything you've heard today? Mm -hmm. Time for Kathy. This is just a question to show I don't completely understand what yeah. Circuit Breaker is, sure. but um, to the extent I understand it, when I see those numbers jump around a lot, that's student-related, yeah, the so specific student you've got yeah. in? Um, yeah, I'll just give you a brief overview because it's related to that's Dr. Morris mentioned high, earlier. That's high cost st student, right? And then yeah. You, yeah, so we do a report, same thing as for School Choice, we do a report of any of our students who have high special education costs. Um, we put in the actual services we provide and in order to get any reimbursement for those students, um, their cost has to exceed four times the state foundation level. So that's roughly $40,000. So the cost has to hit 40,000 and then above and beyond that, we get a partial reimbursement, um, which has floated somewhere between 65 and 75% over the past several years. Um, if the foundation budget rises, then that threshold that we have to hit before we start getting reimbursement also theoretically rises as well. So that's one of those possibly negative impacts that might occur from the foundation budget going up. Remains to be seen that the state will do anything to prevent that. But. Once a student comes in to the school district through choice, if it's deemed that they then need to be tuitioned out for more specialized services, are we liable or is their home district liable? Um, that's happened maybe once or twice since I've been here, and um, I believe, at least in the, the example I have, it was not us that was liable. If, if they can't be served in our schools, then it sort of reverts back to the, um, okay. the sending district, and they have to, really, it's ultimately, they're part of the decision-making body. Anything else? Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank this you. has been very helpful, and uh, uh, the, Council is a new process, and we're all kind of learning the process, and we have counselors that have not been involved before, and so I appreciate um, how you've approached it and uh, the help that you've been giving us to make this move forward. As you're exiting, um, I noticed this doesn't have a capital request for the elementary school, so just does that come back up when we're looking at the capital budget? That, that comes in the capital plan and the uh, the requests that are then presented to the okay, Joint Capital okay, Planning Okay, because at that point I just want to um, get your feeling about the adequacy of what you got yeah. or what is potentially in the budget so it's not showing up in this. Yeah, and in the future, again, it's a new process. We haven't historically included sort of the capital as part of the, the operating budget presentation, but if that's something that um, you all want in the future, we can certainly do that. Um, it's just in the past, it's sort of you been know, a separate and I'm conversation. I'm partly asking that, and I mean, it is a longer term, but um, you've got contingency funds that could be drawn on if something, some system failed. So right. I think of them as interactive. It's, sure. you know, a dysfunctional roof that needs repair right now. Um, right. Um, so just, so we can think about it, but it's noticeable that it's not in, it's an operating budget and a capital budget in two different buckets. Right. Yeah. Though I, I will note that the town, I mean, for the municipal departments, it's true too, what you just said. Sure. And uh, so that it's not that we're distinguishing between schools and library and town in that regard, municipal departments are oh, the same. completely, but you know, the issue of 120 degree days in a school because the chiller broke, you right. know, just it, it, splitting the conversation may long term not be uh, advisable if, yeah. but I said that's a and we can certainly, different discussion. We can certainly loop in, again, some of the major themes, because some of these themes are more um, front and center than they've been in the past, so we can, we can do that. Yeah. Um, and just to finish out uh, something Kathy said, and then see what Lynn was going to ask, um, the uh, Joint Capital Planning Committee, as uh, Mr. Mangana knows, is going to be meeting one more time, and we are going to review the process mm -hmm. Uh, 
and the calendar by which we ask for um, proposals and consider proposals and try and come up with um, a process that um, can be improved on now that we have the year-round government flexibility that uh, we didn't have before. So um, you don't need to do this now, but uh, both for Ms. Sherry, who's here, and for you, if you have any recommendations for us to consider, um, uh, certainly we would welcome hearing those suggestions. Lynn. Andy, I was just going to ask, um, given your experience in the past with town meeting and finance and the charter, could to just for the purposes of the committee and also uh, the public explain what's different in terms of how we have to look at the school budget and the library budget? So, was that a question asked? Yeah, I thought it was a question. It was Mr. actually Steinberg. a question yeah. to Andy. Well, that's that's right. Right. Yeah, okay, I wasn't sure. What, I don't think that there's, a, I'm hoping that there's not a substantial difference and maybe I should turn it, that's why I'm turning it back to you a little bit too. I think that what we've been trying to do this year is to have as much continuity in process as we could possibly have in order to move from a budget process that had been in place for um, forever until this year. And um, the, because we couldn't redesign a process instantly. And I think that's what I was getting at with capital. Um, the next piece for the operating budget will be, and I think that that was why I was uh, a little bit of what my first question was about is, uh, how we go about establishing the uh, guidelines, what we used to call the guidelines, I don't know what we're gonna call them next, but may still be the same. But, you know, the initial stages of the budget process for next year, because this year we were concentrating on a budget process that would work in overlapping two forms of government. Next year we're gonna have to do it all within a single form of government, and uh, um, so that'll be state the next stage. But there is a difference between what town meeting could do with a budget and these budgets and what the town council can do. The, the big difference is that um, in the charter, and um, it, I, I can give a very specific example um, members of town meeting several years ago were very concerned and got lobbied very hard about um, uh, library paraprofessionals and you had to bring that one up <laughs> well but it was the example yeah. and um, so that a, um, an effort was made at the time of town meeting to do an amendment to uh, make that change on the floor of town meeting. Um, the charter doesn't give the council the same, that uh, degree of flexibility that existed before, yes? Yeah, so I just, two thoughts, and I, I wanna be really clear, I'm speaking for myself, I'm not speaking for the Amherst Regional School Committee on the matter, in this case, the Amherst School Committee. So I think what's similar is that we used to, we typically made presentations to the Finance Committee, so that this structure feels really natural in terms of being familiar, and, and, and um, I think on your end, then the next step feels different, right? Uh, but we always did ask for the Finance Committee's recommendation, you know, when it went to town meeting, and, and I think that looks the same. So two differences, uh, or one difference and one consideration is that the timing, um, so we're, we're still operating under the same timing as we did in the past, uh, I've said this before and I'll say it again from my perspective, from the staff perspective, uh, if we, you know, the school committee voted this budget two months ago, roughly. Um, so we have a lot more state information out. So, you know, whether the school committee can consider a slightly different timeline, you know, the region can't change, but the Amherst Public School timeline could change given this. And uh, I would find it beneficial to be having some of the conversations, the financial conversations a bit later when we have more information from state. So we put out our initial budget documents in January before the governor's released his budget. And that feels, not that the governor's budget ends up 
being holding, but it, it's a guidance document that, that gets discussed. So I think there perhaps is an opportunity um, for conversation between the, finan the finance committee here, the town council and the school committee to adjust timelines moving back so that we have, we're undergoing less changes. I think that the consideration I wanted to share is this was a particularly positive budget year, as, we, as we've said. It's a really different process when we're making cuts instead of ads. And so I, I can't say that um, it's hard for me to assess the differences because this is a really atypical year. It's atypical year financially. It's atypical year that there's really significant changes being talked about the state. Uh, none of them, as I re not to repeat myself, necessarily have positive impacts. Some might have some slightly negative, or, or not slightly, some negative impact on the district. Um, the, the range of what's being discussed in school funding this year at the state is, is broader and the range is wider than it is typically. So that's, I think, the other thing to note is just this is an atypical year on multiple fronts and I think next year odds are will be more typical one way or the other and, and I think we should continue the conversation. Yeah, the um, charter does have a date in there, I think, for that you were to provide to the town manager, which is different from prior years, and so I don't know if that gives any more flexibility um, and allows you to, to re-examine your process, but we're going to have to rethink the timetable all the way through because we want to make it as beneficial to everybody who's involved in the process to get to the best end result that we have. And um, I guess the last thing I'll say to you, Dr. Morris, is that I, this year was particularly difficult for um, figuring out how to work the regional budget process into uh, the council process. And it's actually something that um, I spent time with the Charter Commission about when they developed the charter to make sure that there was some flexibility built in there. and. Uh, you know, it, it, but it did create a confusing year, and I really thank you for your help in making it work. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yes. Question. Um, the, how the different levels connect. For example, there's been a decrease in, in students nationally, um, I guess because of the budget um, 2008, I'm not sure, um, whether people just didn't get married and didn't have kids. Um, so how does that translate from the elementary school to the middle school to the high school? Is it, uh, or, or is there kind of jumps and gaps? Sure, so I think what we have now in our, our current elementary school, so not budget next year, but our current, is that our fifth and sixth grade are um, larger cohorts of students, and then we see a pretty significant drop um, after that. So one of the budget adjustments that Mr. Mangano spoke about is we need fewer classroom teachers next year because we're gonna have fewer classrooms because our sixth grade cohort is larger than the incoming kindergarten cohort. Uh, we may have a little bit of that next year. This sixth grade cohort it happens to be a significantly large cohort. Um, when we look at grades, current kindergarten through fourth grade, they look pretty stable. Um, so we will have this wave of students, you know, rather large groups of students going to the secondary level. And two years from now, I think, you know, it looks and all our projections show us kind of Stabling, stabilizing where you know, the grade levels are pretty well aligned in terms of quantity of students. And eventually that'll hit the regional level as well. And if anyone is interested, you know, um, I can share with Paul or you can get in touch with us directly. You know, NESDEC does our enrollment projections. And they're, they're projections, um, but they are helpful to look through. And what they project is kind of a leveling off of the decline at the elementary level that we've seen. And just, again, what a, basically, what I summarize, a kind of stabilizing and plateauing of enrollments look going forward. So, well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So while uh, Ms. Sherry is continuing to do the setup, I do need to 
just as a matter of uh, annual statement that I have to make is that um, my wife is a employee of the Jones Library, works part-time at the North Amherst Library, and um, I have forever been um, in conversations with the State Ethics Commission about what the rules are that apply, which turn out have some fluidity to them from year to year as to what you get and back in the way of answers. But in any event, I have filed a disclosure statement. Um, what I have been advised is that um, I can be involved with discussions where the um, discussion is the budget as a whole, and um, that uh, that is what our responsibility is, is to vote a bottom line budget approach for um, the library. Um, if the discussion at any point starts evolving towards something that would um, affect um, as opposed to the entire bottom line, a piece of the budget that might involve um, something having to do with her salary or position, um, I may make a choice during the course of the meeting to recuse myself and turn this over to the vice chair of the committee. So, thank okay. you. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, uh, let me start by introducing uh, the library trustee that has joined me today. This is Tamsin Ely, uh, and I thank her for being here today. Okay. I'm, um, so I did not print the, the actual presentation out for you. It's, it's taken from the budget packet that was given to you, but I'm happy to email this to you as well so you can, uh, so you can have it. It's primarily the same thing but much small, but much smaller. So up on your screen is the library's mission statement. It was written uh, four years ago after a year-long community engagement process, uh, and it states that we will be a community hub to a diverse population of Amherst residents where the community can enhance their lifelong learning pursuits. And in order to complete this mission, we need engaged staff, adequate funding, state-of-the-art technology, mutually beneficial relationships with the other town departments, and the full engagement of Amherst residents. Our current goals include to provide pleasant, safe, and up-to-date buildings, to maintain exceptional customer service, to expand our funding sources, and to provide quality materials and programs to our patrons. Right now we have three immediate priorities. The first is to secure additional sources of revenue so that we can continue to attract and retain motivated staff, as well as continue to provide high quality services, materials, and programs. Second, we are working to secure capital funding for the expansion and renovation of the Jones Library building. And third, we're in the process of re-examining the roles of the branch libraries, including evaluating their collections and programs, technology, and capital needs. So the Jones Library System has so much to be proud of, starting with the staff, the friends, and the volunteers. They are the reason the Jones is su as successful as it is. And then there's our incredible uh, patrons. Almost 19,000 Amherst residents have active library cards. Over half of them fall into the 18 to 59 year old bracket. But interestingly, college students use the Jones more than people over the age of 60. 22% uh, of our circulation is to college students and 15% is to patrons over 60. Staff accomplishments include participation in a year long series of workshops on collection diversity to help ensure our collections represent people of all backgrounds. We received a $15,000 grant to help us celebrate the Jones Centennial, and we provide all types of programming, such as one-on-one -on -one drop in technology support, early rele release events for teens. Every second grader in town is given a tour of the library, and in many cases, their very first library card. I added this slide about our information desk accomplishments because it tells a story. Specifically, the graph on the right it, it tracks the different kinds of questions we are asked. We categorize each question as either being a true research question, 
a book search question, a question about the library, using the library's technology, or a question about using the patron's personal devices. And uh, we thought it was really interesting that even in this world where Google is queen, uh, the number of true research questions we were asked was at its highest the last year. One piece of data that we do not have is wireless usage. Uh, we know more and more that people are using their own devices at the library, such as their you know, phones and tablets, but we can't tell you how often they're logging on to our Wi-Fi, the town's Wi-Fi, and using our printers to print from, because um, they they're just coming in with their phones and hitting print, and it prints on our machines. So these are services we have always provided, but we're no longer able to track. So just as we're seeing a shift in use from hard copy books in, uh, to digital sources and reference, we're seeing the same shift in holdings and circulation. And of course, this is industry-wide. The number of electronic items that the Jones owns and the number of electronic items that the Jones circulates continues to increase exponentially. And our collection of physical items, as well as their circulation, is basically leveling off. Uh, and it leveled off from FY17 to 18. So what we do is we assign a dollar figure to each item borrowed, each question asked, and each program attended. And so when we do this and add it all up, the value totals almost $8.7 million at a cost of only $1.9 million. Um, and I joke, but um, that's really a great use of tax dollars. Our challenges, so just as is the case for all town departments, it always comes down to funding. Uh, our buildings, specifically the Jones and North Amherst buildings, have needs. Personnel, we are unable to fill two full-time positions. They were left vacant last summer due to retirements, uh, and we have just decided to not um, fill those positions. Uh, programming demand, uh, this is a really great problem to have, actually, but I just we don't have enough staff and, and money to be able to offer enough programs to meet the demand. The same thing goes for our open hours, additional open hours. It's another great problem to have. Patrons want more hours than we can afford, specifically nighttime and weekend hours. So next I wanted to talk about the library's three separate revenue buckets. Everyone always says the library is different, and I wanted to explain why. We are one of the state's hybrid libraries. We are part town department and part our own 501c3. So there's the legal piece of the puzzle where the town approves the amount of funding which will go to the library, and then the trustees determine how that money is spent. But what this slide is showing you is in regards to the actual money and how it's handled. Uh, it gets complicated because we rely on many different sources of revenue, and we are paying our bills through these three different institutions. We have the town, the library's corporation, and the friends of the library. So the town of, of appropriation, uh, all these accounts under the town's logo on the left-hand side of the screen, these are all held by the town. The town appropriation, JCPC, CPA funds, they're voted on by the town, and then they're spent accordingly by library staff. Our annual state aid award is also held by the town, but it is not subject to appropriation. Library staff determines how that money is spent, but when we spend that money, the bills are processed first by our business office, and then they go through the town's accounting department, who cuts the, the final check. State and federal grants are applied for and spent by library staff, but they are received and processed by town accounting. We have two uh, trusts where we are only allowed to pay, uh, to spend the uh, interest income earned on books. They're called the Adams and Westcott Trusts. They are also held by the town. Library staff are responsible for determining how that money is spent. And then there's overdue fines. Uh, I wanted to do a little clarifying here. So patrons pay their overdue fines to the library, but we turn these, town, these funds over to the town monthly. And so overdue fines are not spent by the library. Uh, they're not used to buy books, for example, as some would believe. And there's the library corporation, which is in uh, the center of the screen. It's overseen by the six elected trustees. We are, the, the corporation is audited annually by an auditor completely separate from the town's audit, annual audit. The funds listed in the middle of the screen, 
Uh, they are received, processed, and spent by the library staff in conjunction with the Board of Trustees. Our corporation undergoes the same set of checks and balances that the town does. And the third bucket belongs to the Friends of the Jones Library System. They take in donations to support the library, and the Friends, in conjunction with the staff, receive, process, and spend the money on programs and circulating materials. On to our specific revenue sources. As you can see, uh, the library's primary source of revenue is by far the town appropriation at 75%, followed by the endowment draw at almost 12%, state aid at 6.5%, and then fundraising at almost 6%. Regarding the town appropriation, it's important to understand that this money is only used for two things. It pays the majority of the library's personnel costs, and it pays the Munson Memorial Library rent. So because of this, every year the library has to turn, turn over to the town approximately $80,000 uh, to pay the remainder of our personnel costs. The town appropriation is not used for anything else, such as insurance and inspection fees and auditor fees, utilities, HVAC maintenance, vehicle maintenance, supplies, materials, programs. You get the point. So this is why the endowment is so important. From FY12 to FY18, we have increased our reliance on fundraising by over 850%, so that we can decrease our reliance on the endowment draw by 33% so far. As of FY18, last fiscal year, the library's reserves were entirely spent due to the increase in healthcare costs combined with the decrease in the endowment draw rate, which I'll talk more about in a minute. But by not filling these two uh, full-time positions, we hope to be able to grow our reserves again, while at the same time keeping the draw rate low. We, we just don't feel comfortable relying on fundraising for staffing costs, and I don't wanna hire somebody new and not be successful in fundraising and then have to lay somebody off. So a bit of our endowment history. So in 08 and 09, the economy was in decline, and as a result, the trustees at that point switched from a strategy of passive management of their portfolio to active management. And um, that's the, the first uh, hit that you see uh, that the endowment took. And then in FY10, we received a, a very large uh, bequest from the Woodberries uh, in the amount of $750,000. And that's the uptick that you're seeing there in FY10. In FY11, uh, we separated the Woodbury front Fund from the rest of the endowment, uh, purely for bookkeeping purposes. And so that's the slight decrease that you see. Um, and then in FY15 through 16, the current set of trustees returned to a strategy of passive management. And, and that's the uptick that you're seeing after that. So now we're, we're again in an excellent position. We're paying uh, much less for our um, uh, endowment uh, for Vanguard uh, than we were paying before. Uh, we are back to $8 million in the endowment with a goal of $10 million so that a 4% draw rate will give us the funding we need to operate comfortably. I want to highlight the Friends of the Jones Library System. So this organization was established in 1997. It's not that old. It is its own 501c3 corporation run by a group of volunteers and supporters. And their purpose is to focus public attention on the Jones Library services and special needs. Until now, fundraising for the Jones Library has been undertaken through separate annual fund appeals by both the Jones Library Corporation and the Friends of the Library. And for many supporters, donating to each uh, organization is, has seemed confusing, redundant. And so this past year, we merged these two organizations, the financial appeal specifically, under one roof. So now it's under the Friends of the Jones Library System. And with this joint venture, the library, the corporation, and the friends, we're just seeking to simplify your giving. And now all donations are solely solicited by the friends, and uh, gifts will continue to be used for all three buildings for books and programs. On to our expenses. So as you can see from the chart, the library's primary expenses are salaries and benefits at 78.5%. Uh, and, and as I said before, the town appropriation is covering 75% of those costs. Uh, that, and that's followed by materials at 8%. 
from FY12 to FY18, utilities costs have only risen 7% and materials expenses have only risen by 12%, but our programming expenses have risen by over 200%. And these are all great things. So our materials expenditures, this slide also tells a very important story. In the past decade, materials purchasing has been greatly reduced in order to help close our budget gap. I want you to focus on the yellow line, specifically where it's circled in red from FY10 to FY11. So in order to remain certified by the state, all public libraries have to spend a certain percentage of its entire operating budget on books. Once upon a time, before the economic downturn, the Jones was able to spend as much as 63% more than our required amount on books. But last year, and uh, you know, since FY11, we were only able to spend 7% more than our requirement. And that difference is what you're seeing circled in, in red there. It's a 57% cut, or $73,000, to, to the materials budget in terms of excess over the requirement. You can buy a lot of books with $73,000, and so we're talking on an annual basis. And so the reason I point this out is, you know, we're meeting our requirement, and that's, and that's great, but this is a very well-read community. Um, I do believe that this is one of the reasons that our circulation has leveled off and, and slowed down, is because we just don't have as many books on the shelves as we used to. This is the big game. Here is the budget summary. This is the format that the library and most of the other town departments have historically used, where expenses equal revenue sources. This summary was approved by the Board of Trustees on March 26, 2019. And so above, you can see it, will, it shows $2,655,699 worth of expenses for FY20. And it shows which accounts down below we will use to pay those, those expenses. Overall, it is a 1% decrease to our operating budget from FY19 to 20. So in the top section under expenses, uh, under salaries is a 2.1% decrease. Benefits is a 7% decrease. For materials, there will be an 8.7% increase. Uh, and the programming <coughs> line maintains last year's budget cut. Down below, under revenue sources, uh, that's where you see circled in yellow our request for the 2.5% increase to the town appropriation. Uh, then there is a 4.6% endowment draw rate, uh, which equals a 6.4% decrease. Then we have budgeted for a 34% decrease in reliance on gifts and annual fund fundraising. But this is only because, so once our, six, our fundraising efforts are successful, depending on the level of success, uh, it could mean additional staff, maybe, or additional programs or some combination thereof. Uh, there will also, we were also expecting a 0.5% increase to state aid. And lastly are our budget concerns. Um, we have four of them. The first one, uh, because our anticipated outside funding sources, they're based on historical amounts, we may or may not meet those anticipated levels. Number two, the trustees approved a 4.6 draw rate for FY20 in order to meet our immediate needs. Um, it, it is a decrease from last year's uh, 5%. Number three, in order to help close the ongoing budget gap, over the past several years, we have made very severe cuts to materials program purchasing, supplies, programming, staff training. There is, there's just no more fat left in the library's budget. Um, and number four, without additional open hours, especially nights, meeting room availability continues to be limited. And I know, um, so uh, Tammy Tamson Ely is the only trustee that's here. Uh, this is the email address. You can reach out to them anytime, or you can send the questions to me. Um, they're happy to chat with you. And now I'll take your questions. So, turn to my colleagues. Let's go, Kathy. Okay, um, I'll try to organize my comments because I had some comments, some questions. When on the reduction of two full-time employees, did you turn them into four part-time people? No. Is it a total, so t two people are, are just gone out of the budget? Correct. Okay. Um, I also, when I'm, I'm looking at sources of revenue, the 
it looks like you're, you've got a decrease in the amount um, that the friends are bringing in. Um, and it's, you're budgeting for next year at about the level of FY18, but lower than FY19. Do you have a sense of FY19 is going to hit the 54? It's about a $4,000 difference. Um, so do you have a, did you go lower for FY20 based on revenues are coming in at less than you expected? Uh, so uh, awesome question. So you know when we when department heads put these uh, sh these charts together and 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 projections, um, when we put this together, the friends and the trustees fundraising had not merged yet, and and um, we had not yet decided to not fill those two positions. So the friends over the past few years. Their efforts, their fundraising efforts have been dwindling. They have been relying more on the Woodbury Fund for programming. And so, yes, I took a very conservative guess as to how much uh, they would raise. But now that we're almost starting FY20, um, I'm actually thrilled to say this merger has been very successful. Um, we have a group of dedicated volunteers who are soliciting new donors, and um, we were hoping to raise $152,000 for FY19. That was in part to cover those two full-time positions, um, but since we're not hiring, since we're not filling those two positions, um, we do not have to reach that $152,000 goal, and we are already at $130,000. So long story short is we are very successful, and I do think that for FY20, um, that, that these fundraising figures, both from the friends and from gifts, Sammy's, and grants, I think, I think those numbers are low. Okay, so Concerned. you're mentioning 100,000, and in what we're looking at, it's in 54,000 or 50, so there's another line somewhere on fundraising? So the, under friends in Woodbury, it goes from 54 to 50, but then under gifts, Sammy's, and grants, there's 152, uh, down to 100 for FY20. And now that, so historically, until the merger, those lines have been separate, but now, uh, now after the merger exists, those two lines will become one. Okay, I'm just, when I add the two lines, it looks lower than it was before if I add both of them. So are you saying that it's coming in more positively? But Yes, so when we put these numbers together, I, so FY19 hasn't finished yet. Uh, so um, when, I put, when we put these numbers together for FY20, I was being much more conservative. I was much more nervous than I am now. Okay. And then I had a question um, on your, your hypothesis that circulation is down because you're buying less, fewer books. Um, how much can you assess that people are using electronic more? Um, so that the circulation is coming in. And because you all were also linked to Boston Public Library, a person in Amherst can be getting books either, especially the way you set up C.W. Mars or uh, what's the woman's name that we're now in? Libby. But Libby. You know, Libby, I can check either the Amherst regional circulation or Boston and put myself on the list for an audible or a book. So I think we're... For a certain generation of people that are comfortable with that, can, can you assess that? Because it seems to me that we're moving away from having a book in our hands, or some of us are. Um. Uh, yeah, so uh, two pieces to that. So yes, the electronic resources that the, that the Jones Library pays for uh, contributes to, uh, we get statistics for that, and that is included in our circulation statistics. Um, and so Libby uh, is included in that. But what is not included is, uh, so, so the stats that we get are through Central and Western Mass CW Mars. But if you uh, go on to Libby and choose the Boston Public Library or a different network, we do not get those CERC stats. So that's certainly a piece of the puzzle. Yeah, and I, I was just saying that it may not be that because you have fewer books on the shelf, fewer people are coming in to get books. It may be that they're getting access to 
books because they can go to different electronic resources? It, it is multiple reasons. And so in you know my previous two times uh, chatting with you all, uh, I've given other theories and this was, this was another theory. Lynn? This has nothing and yet everything to do with your budget and that is you have an impressive growth in volunteers over the last couple of years. Congratulations on that. Are your volunteers, uh, are the people who can work to or provide volunteer services to the town in lieu of paying some of their taxes, are they allowed to do that for the library? Yeah, there, we do have a few senior tax, uh, tax work off uh, volunteers, not many. Most of them are not those. Okay, thank you. But people are allowed to, yeah. Shelby. So one thing I'm hearing from people is that we are spending more on capital invest capital projects and reducing our services. And that was one of the challenges you showed in your slides where the staff for more programming and you know, so that seems to be a big problem. How do you foresee balancing that? So we may you know, get a new building, but if we still don't have the staff to, to um, you know, to do the programming and to stay longer and open, you know, that empty building is not really helpful. No, and, and that's a great question. So one of my one of my biggest problems is the building itself. So because I've got so many rooms and no st no sight lines, I actually have to have more staff in the building than I would if it were like one big studio apartment, for example. Uh, so the way the building will be able to be designed with the new addition will be to have clear sight staff sight lines, um, A. Uh, so And then B is the, the use of the technology, the RFID automated materials handling system, so that we uh, do not plan on adding any more staff. And we'll let the machines do, you know, the work where you're just checking in. It's a scan, and it's a, it's not. It, it, we'll be able to use staff for the customer service aspect of it. That's that's what's important. Thank you. Who else? Timothy. When we look at the other aspect, which is the capital. Um, project, which requires a lot of fundraising. Um, I guess it's a little worrisome that your present fundraising is down when you've got to do a major fundraising effort. Uh, what are your plans for that? Uh, so that's what I'm saying is uh, I believe wholeheartedly that these figures here under fundraising are too low. They're, they're very conservative. Um, this year we have been extremely successful. Um, in fact, if you had told me last year at this time that we would be this successful, I would have said no way. Um, and so this, this incredible group of people, which keeps getting larger, that is working on our annual fund uh, giving, they will uh, take it to the next level and turn it into a capital campaign. I keep looking back and forth. Um, let's see any other questions? And I've been trying to limit my role for the reasons oh, I stated at the beginning and not ask a lot of questions. You have questions. to read your mind, Andy. Yeah. <laughs> the questions we should be asking. Uh, no, you've done a good job. So, uh, no, this has been very helpful. And, uh, I think that it... Uh, you know, I, um, Andy, it's not really a new question, just building on Shalini's, because the question of staffing and hours with the space and the circulation we now have, it's, it, um, we've been cutting back because of a tight budget. And it, to me, we've got a tight budget out for several years. Um, you know, my understanding is the under 20s, where there's a lot of staffing, they, they get no benefits, is that correct, or they get? No, they, yeah, they all get prorated benefits throughout the town. Oh, do they get prorated, all, so they get some part of health insurance, some part of? Not health uh, insurance, uh, not sick, sick, personal, 
vacation. But no, any retirement? At, so that, toward that, a pension? No, when you're, when you're under 20 hours a week, that's, um, that's OBRA, I think. That, yeah, you'd have to talk to HR about that. But that's, but so that's town line. It's a town line, but well, I'm not sure that there's any money put in, into it for them. So they're a less expensive employee because of the benefit structure than two of them would not equal one FTE if it was a full-time person, correct, in terms of total cost? Can you ask the question? What is your question? Okay. Um, you've been able to, to meet some of the demands of operating by going to under 20, which saves you in the fringes, I, the uh, fringe costs. No, I would disagree with that statement. No. no. Um, we have actually been increasing the number of hours that our full-timers have. Um, and uh, our, the number of part-timers have reduced as well, as you, you can see in, the, in yep. the, the packet. It's not in this slide, but in the packet, you'll see the number of uh, part-timers has actually maintained the same. So no, we don't, we're not cutting positions and then hiring more part-timers. No. And regarding you know, the open hours, people have asked about that. And so in my mind, that's such a dream scenario that I put it there kind of as a placeholder but um, I don't see, I see the town of Amherst having so many other needs that um, I, being able to add open hours is, is not, is not going to happen in my lifetime, according to what I'm seeing, because there are so many things going on. So whether there's a building project or not, we won't be getting more hours. Um. On your value of Jones services, the value of the service, in other words, like the $20 for this or whatever, are those benchmarked um, statewide, nationally, regionally? So it's, a, it's a statewide chart, the, yeah, that, that libraries Thank you. and mass use, yeah. Thanks. If not, then I I think that we can um, thank you very much and thank appreciate you. your having been here. And I guess the question that I had uh, asked before, um, of Dr. Morris, um, if you have any thoughts um, as to what we might do differently in the budget process as we go forward to the next year and do a first full year. Is it, a, is it being a council process as opposed to this hybrid year? Um, Please share them. Uh, do you mean now or later? It can be later. It does <laughs> not have to be now. I, I actually wanted to say how much I've appreciated the process. So in five months, I've already seen you all um, three times, and I, it's been so helpful. Uh, I've loved the process, and so I think it, it's only going to keep getting better because now we have this uh, you know, baseline understanding, and then um, you know, you all will get to know me more, and I'll get to know you all more, and um, I think it will only get better. And as far as the timeline, um, it's not. We don't have the same uh, constraints that the schools do, uh, so um, your deadlines are our deadlines. It's we're good. good. Thank you. Lynn, do you have anything? Thank Just you. Thought, thank you. So. To the committee, um, I think that we uh, probably have nothing else that we need to discuss today unless uh, somebody has something that they didn't anticipate or request from previous. Is there anything else, Kathy, that you think of we have on the? No, I, th I, I think I already got my answer when I emailed you since the decision was made at the council on Monday night that OCO will be doing the interviews. Um, for the non -res the residents who are joining us, um, I'm assuming you will be sending the draft we did of potential interview questions to them. I mean, we haven't had a request from them, but just we we yes. we worked on that set. Yeah, we can. We'll. Uh, I'll work with you to make sure we got the right. We have the right one and get that to them. And and could I just get clarification, Lynn? Um, will we as part of the council ever see everyone who has applied for those non-resident positions since this is a we decided it's a council appointment rather than a president 
So it's, it's a question. Um, and I have no idea whether, you know, there are three slots. It may be we only have four people. You know, I don't know what's in the queue. I believe that the way it's now been left is they are council appointments recommended to us by OCA. And therefore, you will receive as a council, but as a confidential document, the CAFs. OK, so OK, that, that is, was a clear answer. Thank you. The only thing I think we need to communicate is that according to the charge that the Finance Committee, I mean, that the Town Council passed, Finance Committee then debated and went back to Town Council, and that is that we would like the appointment of the resident members uh, to be effective July 1. Yes. And uh, I guess the other thing if, uh, is for uh, next Tuesday, we have now posted uh, the uh, amended agenda. And so we will be taking up, in addition to what was previously planned for the meeting, the matter that was referred to us, which I'll refer to as the Airbnb uh, tax. So, um, and so if you have any questions that would be um, helpful uh, to have in advance, I would say, um, you know, since it's a small committee, just send them to either Paul or Sonia, whoever seems to be the more appropriate person, because I'll be away for the weekend, and I don't want it to, I want to have a useful discussion. I think the only thing that would be helpful is if there's anything more on the specific questions or um, that are underlying, because we have actually, uh, I think, several questions there. One is, do we want to um, impo have the fee imposed, a fee? Do we want it to be 3% or uh, because the amount is open? And then there was uh, um, to whom it is, you know, to which uh, establishments it's applicable and whether there's any information that would help us make any of those decisions. Of course, that would be nice to have. But otherwise, I think we'll just have the discussion. Yeah. The other issue that was brought up was whether or not, as a finance committee, we see dedicating this revenue stream to anything specific. There was a right, it, it has it has at least thirty five percent has to go place, and there was a recommendation that all of it go to affordable housing. Correct. You know. So. It, is I just want us to understand what the that, what that parameters. That's a part of the discussion. Yeah, I think that that's. Yeah, it it, it opens up a uh, huge problem for future things. I think that we need to uh, at least be aware of what the consequence of that would be, as well as the benefit, since mm -hmm. we know that somebody threw out a benefit, which is to the population that he was advocating for. Right. I, I just want to make sure that we don't, we, that as a committee, we address that. Okay. Okay. It was not to suggest one way or the other, but to just make sure we address it. Um, okay. Um, I have a question and a comment. Yes. Um, question, when are we going to discuss the um, matter of the $500,000 bond issue for the um, CPAC? That will be under the, on the, the that'll be on the 23rd, I believe, when we discuss the uh, Community Preservation Act proposals. Is that the one at the bangs? Or is no. That no. 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 Okay. The, That's our regular finance committee meeting. It has, that CPAC is scheduled for that day. Okay. All right. The 21st is our public hearing at the bangs. That's at 6.30. Okay. Mm -hmm. The 23rd is our regular, well, our regular finance committee meeting. Okay. Meaning one of our two per week, and it's at that meeting that JCPC proposals will be discussed. Okay. So then my, <clears throat> my comment is that in, when trying to read the numbers up there, I knew I hadn't received, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me for being hoarse, a copy of, the, um, this, of her report, and Kathy showed it to me that it was on the town page uh, I would never have known that. Um, I don't, I, I, I look at the webpage. 
I'm now looking at it maybe once a day, but um, you know, when I looked at it again, it wasn't there because it's on a revolving thing. I wouldn't have noticed it was there. I, I just, I think you have to assume it just let us know when something is there where it is. There's some people that don't need to be told, but um, sometimes I do, I need to be directed. There were a whole series of documents that were uh, the budget, uh, with the budget, when the budget was presented, and um, it was all in one um, folder that was uh, in oh, I have that, but in able to look, to be able to look up for it online, I didn't, I didn't know where to look. Um, in other yeah. words, if you look at the finance committee, you won't find it there. You, you would have had to download it. Um, so I think the point is that we didn't necessarily attach it as um, a packet. Are you saying it wasn't a, you didn't look at the packet for today for finance? I'm saying that when I wanted to, to look at it here, I didn't know where to find it. And I, this, this seems to be kind of like, there's all kinds of stuff everywhere, but how do you know where it is when you want it? Well, Perhaps this is just a matter of adding the um, link yes. in the agenda yes. so that it takes us directly to yes. the part of the budget. Yeah, the, uh, Paul? So on the transmission document that I delivered to the council on May 1st, there's a link to the website at amherstma.gov slash budget. The budgets for the library, the regional school districts, the elementary school district, and the town, and in addition to CPAC and JCPC, are all on that one page, amherstma.gov slash budget. It hasn't changed. It's been there no. since May 1st. I, 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 but I didn't realize that. Okay, okay so, so. But I, I just, I'm just saying that the staff transmitted that information to you multiple times. Um, at, at least on May 1st we did. And so... Um, that, where to find it? Yes. It, okay. The, the link was in that. And we, and we put it in our press release, the material that went out to the public, and, okay. and we put well, it Well, today, as a, for the as first time, I saw your, your big thing. You had a, an ad saying budget, and then I saw the little yes. words budget that I could click, but yes. I didn't know it was so there, there and so handy. Yes, so, so, so we, we, we did that in addition to that. To let After your meeting on Monday, we did that so the public can find it e easier, too. So I appreciate your note, pointing that out. Yeah, I will try uh -huh. and uh, do that outside of the course of the meeting. And, to make sure that we sit down together with, uh, on where, where to find things. Um, so we have a member of the public who's actually here. Janice, do you have anything? I'm here from the observing, and I'm not going to say anything. Okay. I have one pure housekeeping thing on minutes. Um, I just want to make sure that the way I've been doing it, Sonia, works for you, that once I've looked at it, I put it in an approved folder, or do, would you prefer I actually link it to an email and send it to you? I think the last time we decided you were going to email it to me because I don't, I have no training in SharePoint and I have nowhere, no idea where to look. Okay, so, so, so I'll, I'll keep, once it becomes an approved document, I'll send it to you. And w at some point we need a discussion about minute taking because uh, some of us have more time than others uh, to so I've been, I've been volunteered, as well as I was will, a willing volunteer, to do final approval of minutes, but when people don't have time to complete the minutes or had questions, I've taken on it to go back and look at the tapes to fill in, because I wasn't taking minutes. So we're just going to have to figure out, because if it gets down to only a few people, can take, Andy doesn't take minutes, and if only a few are taking, it's going to become time consuming. So we'll just have to figure out some, some way to make an adjustment. Yeah. yeah, so it's just an alert. You know, so one meeting I couldn't figure out anyone who took minutes, so I just went and watched the tape and did minutes, you know, but, but that's time consuming, so. One yes. Uh, also, I believe on the agenda for next week is supposed to be looking at the um, goals, not just the goals, but the activities that are, um, and I sent a, an email to you and Kathy with the latest draft on that earlier this week. This is the goal sheet and the goal activities and timeline. So you looked at the goals and I've made the adjustment and sent you that for final approval, but then there's still the activity sheet. 
we need to make it an agenda item for next week, Lynn, or should just Andy and I look at it? How do you want to? I think if Andy and you want to look at it and then bring it to, back to us, that would be fine. Uh, we should look at that and, make sure, and see if we need to amend an agenda to add it. Um, okay. But if there's nothing else, then I think, yes, Shelley. I just had a comment for the town manager. Um, is it possible, what I'm hearing from the public is that when they see the agenda and they want to see the agenda packets, could there be a link in the agenda itself to the agenda packets? so people can find it easily. Um, so, generally for all, all meetings, basically. So I, or at least the town council meetings yeah. then. So, for the ta so I'm not sure if our system allows that uh, in terms of because the links can change around. So if you put a, a dedicated link in, it might go to a dead end page. And I've discovered this with the school department's budget actually. Um, but the organization of the website is that for every meeting, there's a packet, there's a click, you can just go to the meeting date in the council page and go to the packet and the packet is there and every item on, is in the packet. So um, we try to do links to the agenda from the um, meeting posting time. It's, it's, the system isn't as flexible and I understand exactly what people are asking for and it's how intuitive it would be to just say, oh, I wanna click on this agenda item. It doesn't work as easily that way, unfortunately. So could we just send them to the town council page where all these agenda packets are? Like even if it's not going to the individual agenda packet, but maybe it can just say, okay, go to this. That would be a standard link we can add for all. So just go to the town council page. So, so one of the challenges is that the system only allows you to use a certain number of characters when you post the agenda. And so we are already, people are already sort of putting in abbreviations and all kinds of stuff into the agendas when, on the official meeting postings. So to add a link to it is, will, will limit the amount, number of characters. It's, think of it like Twitter allows you 120 characters and you have to do all these things. And some, some people, some committees' agendas are very complex because they like to have lots of um, charter references and things like that and then it gets, jumbled so it's um, it's not as easy I understand what you're saying it's just uh, the system doesn't allow us to do it very easily um, but um, if I think of just finance now with the, the yep. rest of the meetings in May maybe our agenda can it won't be a hot link but just a link back to the page that has so you can do that when you set up your agenda yes yeah so if we do that people will know okay public works here's the link and I'm gonna find the town budget here's uh, on the 23rd, so people won't wonder where, it's here, they just yeah. have to know where to look for it. Mm -hmm. okay. So we will also, if we haven't already, we also break out the town budget by department so it's easier for, they don't have to scroll through the whole gigantic document. Right. So every section is like public works, so you can click on just public works if you just wanna see that. Um, so I think that's, there's a link to that, that subset of documents which is, um, the full budget broken up into smaller sections. Sure, on, exactly. On the page. And I'm just thinking that, that some of these issues are going to come up when we've got JCPC and CPA. Like, where do I find those two things unless we upload those in our packet? But we can just put it in the agenda that here's the link to yeah. those. Uh, again, yeah. every one of those documents is at amherstma.gov slash budget. Yep. We put it all on one page. You know, I found them all, but I didn't yep. think everyone might find them. So <laughs> yeah. I make a suggestion of, of something that's lower tech. Because I understand that this thing about links, they, they kind of expire. Just a sentence telling people where they would find the agenda items that Shalini was asking for. To, to, to get the packet, the agenda packet, go to this page or whatever. It doesn't have to be a link, just a sentence. That's what we're saying, you know, do yeah. that. I, love, I think that we've probably exhausted yeah. this for what we could do. It should do an open meeting yeah. um, because we've got, I think we've identified a set of problems and we need to just try and work together to think them through as to how to resolve them. But I wanted to let the committee adjourn if it wishes. I move that we adjourn. I second it. Okay, so and all in favor? Everybody agrees, so we're adjourned at uh, 345. Thank you.